in any street, in any town, you'll find what's been called the magic mineral. It's asbestos. It's in many household items, in the brakes and clutches of every car. But society has paid a high price for the magic mineral. Tonight, we present startling new evidence about the dangers of asbestos and look critically at the behavior and the morality of the asbestos industry. But with virtually no cooperation from the asbestos companies, this report may inevitably be one-sided. But after very careful research, we believe that the allegations we have to make are true. But our story begins thousands of miles away from here, in a strange Canadian mining town they've actually named Asbestos. These Canadian mines supply over half the Western world's white asbestos, including most of the 95,000 tonnes imported into Britain every year. Despite health scares in the mid-1970s, mining is still on a massive scale. Asbestos in Canada is big business. Exports are worth 300 million pounds a year. Once the valuable asbestos fibers are extracted from this rock, they're pushed into every corner of our daily lives. Asbestos is all around us. In water pipes, pipe lagging, sheds and garages, oven gloves, ironing boards, simmering pads, oven doors, DIY wall plugging, protective clothing for firefighters, and the brakes and clutches of every car and thousands of trains. Asbestos can also kill you. Please raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you are about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth. It's the asbestos from that same Canadian mine that's probably killing this woman. Please state your full name. Too ill to go to court, lawyers videotaped her evidence. Can you describe how you would see the asbestos particles as they affected you? Well, they look like snowflakes, you know, real stringy. They come down, they're pretty thick at that time. What is it that you're presently suffering from? No, and the, the asbestos is growing. It's all in, like grapes, all the lumps. I'm living from day to day, you know. Since then, how has your physical condition progressed? Look at me. Next day, Mary Johnson died of cancer. She was killed by asbestos fibers so tiny they can't be seen by the naked eye. Two million of them could fit on a pinhead. <laughs> to most of us, Ray Price is the traditional public image of asbestos disease. In this 1975 film, Ray is suffering from asbestosis, a disease we've known about for generations, lungs scarred and clogged by asbestos dust. Alice has been hit by a recently discovered disease, more insidious and deadly than asbestosis, asbestos cancer. No, let me flower if you do good fit. Alice's cancer is called mesothelioma, or cancer of the lung lining. Is there nothing to say? It's invariably fatal. Bye bye. It's only established cause the dust from asbestos. <sighs> Alice is 47 years old. 30 years ago, when she was just 17, Alice worked for nine months at Cape Asbestos in Yorkshire. Well, I came off a farm, you know, to work there. I was in Lincolnshire. And you know, it was just like air making on the indoors, you know. There was just white, thick dust all over, like around your eyes and your nose. And it used to collect on my uh, nostrils, you know. You used to have two big lumps of dust on your nostrils. And then you used to spit on your hands to get all the dust off your clothes, you know. We used to sweep up three and four times a day and it was 
You know, like thick. It well, it was just like hair making or indoors. Were you, were you ever warned that uh, working there could be dangerous, that you could finish up? No, yeah, we used to fool about. We used to make wigs out of that. Uh, you know, like you fool about at work. We used to make wigs out of asbestos and put them on his heads and, you know, no. I never, never thought it was dangerous at all. Now Alice is so ill, her 65-year-old husband, Tom, has to bear the brunt of looking after their two younger children. Patsy, age five, and Paul, age 15. A few months ago, Alice's doctor told her she was dying of asbestos cancer. Well, I jumped round the room like a frog. I did. That's what I did. I had a feeling that I had something serious by then, you know, because I wasn't getting any better. And I just said, you've come to tell me that I've had it, haven't you? Says you. And uh, she says you. I says how long have I got then? It's three to six months. And when you think back, you know that it's just the results of working, you know, for a paid wage. It's a job that you didn't think was dangerous. Never entered your head it was dangerous. Makes me feel right bitter. Because, I mean, uh, I know I'm 47, but I had a little girl, you know, when I was 43, and... I mean, she's only you, isn't she? And they're telling me that I've only got six months to live. I've a lot to feel bitter about, really. Because I suppose it's selfish, really, isn't it? Because I worry about me not being able to see their best years, you know. Seeing how Paul, you know, is my only lad. And, um, I mean, how Patsy's only five. Uh, I don't know whether it's a selfish thing or not, but I think every mother wants to watch the kids develop, don't they? And I don't like to be there and watched over them. That's why I had them for, didn't I? Alan Meehan's Alice's Specialist. In the West Riding, we see a lot of this disease. It now represents about uh, 8 to 10 percent of my practice of malignant disease of the chest. So how would you describe it? Well, locally, we're in epidemic proportions. We asked if asbestos was always the cause of mesothelioma cancer. Personally, I feel that all mesotheliomas are related to asbestos, and it's really a question of of making this uh, connection. And I think in the past, the connection wasn't widely recognized and was not made. But my generation, and certainly my immediate generation of professional colleagues nationally, do not see mesothelioma in the absence of uh, a history of exposure to asbestos. Georgina is also suffering from cancer due to asbestos. She may look 70, but she's only 52. As a 14-year-old girl, she worked for two years at Dick's Asbestos, London. Like Alice, tiny, indestructible asbestos fibres lodged in her lungs, causing cancer. But cancer can take years to develop. So it was not until 38 years later, 1979, that Georgina discovered she had lung cancer due to asbestos. Since then, Georgina has shrunk from an active, jolly woman of 15 stone to a painful eight stone. Well, I get these terrible pains. At times, I just don't want to be bothered with anybody. just want to shut myself away. Um, I never realised there was pain in the world like it, but there is. You just have to stand and scream when it starts. That's how bad it is. Even now, today, I, uh, I'm not too bad today, but it could come on and it could start and I'll just have to have a screaming session with myself. So what I do is I go in the bathroom and put something to my mouth because I don't like my children or other people to know what I'm suffering. It's terrible. Um, 
I think it's the quo, it's quo, because it controls you, and you can't control that. Doesn't matter how you try. And each day, I know that I'm getting worse, and I know that I'm, I know that I'm dying, but I can't really accept it. Long before Georgina's exposure to asbestos, the manufacturers knew the danger. This factory inspector's report was the first warning sign. That was in 1898, 84 years ago. By 1906, a British worker reported to his doctor that his team of 10 asbestos workers were all dead. Average age, 30. By 1931, the link with disease was so clear the government passed asbestos regulations. They ordered that there should be no asbestos dust in the workplace. By 1935, the link between lung cancer and asbestos became recognised. 14 years after that cancer risk was known, a doctor noted that British company Cape Asbestos in South Africa used young children to process raw asbestos by hand. Standing over them, a supervisor with a whip. Even by the age of 12, he discovered, several child workers had asbestosis and heart failure. By 1955, Oxford University scientists found that lung cancer amongst British asbestos workers was 10 times the national average. Smoking can greatly increase that lung cancer risk. And by 1960, doctors established that the lethal cancer, mesothelioma, was caused by asbestos. But it has no connection with smoking. Yet despite these cancer warnings, asbestos sales more than doubled over the next 20 years. By 1969, the British government introduced new regulations. But in fixing what they called safe dust levels, they took no account of the risks of cancer. That same year, 1969, the asbestos companies predicted that the mesothelioma cancer rate has reached the crest of a wave which will decline in the next decade. They were proved wrong. A decade later, mesothelioma deaths had risen by over 300%. Asbestos has been regulated for half a century. How many victims has it claimed? Take Cape Asbestos in East London. Its general manager was Tony Mendel. How many funerals did you go to during your 12 years at oh, Cape Asbestos? About 110, I'd say. Those I knew I could think of and count, recount, looking back through my diary. Certainly about 110. And um, in 12 years, it's, you, know, you appear to yourself, you appear to be going virtually to a, a funeral every week. I, I kept a black tie. Uh, in my in my desk drawer. Simply because going to funerals was a, a dismal part of uh, management of that particular factory. Three weeks after this interview, Tony Mendel discovered that he too had asbestosis. John Todd, an asbestosis victim himself, was a lagger in the Glasgow shipyards, where hundreds of workers used asbestos. How many dead in his union branch? I would say, a conservative guess, 160. Out of how many members? Out of it, six, seven hundred members. 160 people dead out of yeah. six or seven hundred yeah. members? Yes. And what sort of age are they well, catching the disease now? Well, the, the likes of Harry Smith died there, 46 years of age. Willie, Willie Birmingham, Burgi as we called him, he was 43. Harry's brother died four years ago at 46 years of age. They all had asbestosis and related cancers. And uh, what well, well, uh, John McGuinness, he, he, they diagnosed the disease when he was 26, and yet they tell you you can't catch the disease at that age. You've got to be at least 40 years in the industry. Jimmy Duggan was only 24, he's got the disease. So, I mean, where is this 40 years? It's long association. It's no, it's maybe long term growth, but a short association will give MDI asbestosis. It's been the biggest killer that we know of in the occupational health field. It's killed thousands and thousands of people. Most of the others that we know of, know of have really only killed hundreds. So it is the granddaddy of the occupational health killers. And it's not only affected work people, it's affected their wives, their children, their relatives, and also members of the public, who, because we now know it gives cancer, as opposed to just an asbestos dust clogging of the lungs disease, uh, it kills members of the public who only get very small exposures, or who might only get a small exposure. That small exposure could come from anywhere. 
Thousands of tons of asbestos are in pipe lagging. Thousands more are in the roofs and walls of buildings. Asbestos is used in many domestic products, but it wasn't until 1976, 78 years after the first danger sign, that the industry introduced warning labels on some, but not all, of these products. But how effective is that warning? Well, this is the British warning label, so-called. Uh, this is a grim joke. In the United States, I don't think that this would be considered by any jury to be an adequate warning that the material can cause such diseases as cancer uh, and fatal asbestosis. It says, uh, if you read it carefully, it says, observe the safety rules. It doesn't say this stuff can give you cancer. It says, take care with asbestos. It almost reads like an advertisement that asbestos will take care of you, so use more of it. Uh, this is ridiculous as a warning, and, it's, and it's, it's criminal on the part of the British government that they let this go for a warning in their country. These spacemen are preparing to remove asbestos from a block of London council flats. It's such a dangerous job, the men wear masks with a separate oxygen supply and three layers of protective clothing, which must be decontaminated after use. In these flats, asbestos board for insulation it's on the walls of five rooms, including this child's bedroom. As local residents were the first to realize, any damage to the wall and dangerous dust could be released. Over six million tons of asbestos have been put into houses, schools and hospitals all over Britain. Now this one London borough, Lambeth, has 5,000 dwellings to remove asbestos from. It's an expensive job that must be very carefully carried out. Lambeth Council Special Unit handles asbestos as if it was radioactive waste. Lambeth feels it imperative to remove all three main types of asbestos. Brown, only a small amount used in Britain. Blue, about one twentieth of British volume and virtually banned since 1970, but which has been blamed for almost all the deaths here. And the most common, white, which has always been 95% of asbestos used in Britain. So Ross Hunt, who works for a major uh, asbestos company, defends white asbestos well, this, to the hilt. This, this chap here is chrysotile, the white asbestos, the one for which we 95 or 96 percent of all asbestos that's used is this one, chrysotile. One of the important remits of this unit years ago was to look at people, to talk to doctors, to find out whether or not there was any excess or preponderance of lung disease or deaths caused by possibly asbestos? The answer is no, none. This extraordinary landscape is in Canada, where white asbestos is pumped out continuously. This is where the theory about the relative safety of white asbestos was born. So we came here to investigate for ourselves whether white asbestos was really as safe as we were told, and so many people believe. Here, whole townships are dwarfed by the white asbestos mountains. The mines pump out asbestos waste day and night. The locals call it white gold. The Arabs have their oil, they say, we have our asbestos. Giant American companies have dominated this 300 million pound industry, along with British company, Turner and Newell, who for 44 years owned the Bell Mine here. Death rates in the asbestos mining towns, say the companies, are no higher than in the general population. But what about Pauline Poiré, a secretary, dead from mesothelioma cancer? She just lived near a white asbestos mill. Olise Garneau, dead from cancer at 36. As a child, she slid down the giant slag heaps that shadowed her home. But her family still lived beneath the same white mountain. With no alternative jobs, her son is already an asbestos miner, and her daughter plays beneath the same slag heaps. Or Roger Jean, he only ever worked with white asbestos. Now he can't even drive a car without oxygen. In 12 years, his union have made more than a thousand claims for men like him, most with asbestosis or lung cancer. Yet the government have still reported that only two out of every 100 workers here suffer disease like Roger Jean. 
If you read the study, it's very simple to see why, is that they did not include cancer, which is the major cause. They only included asbestosis itself. They did not include workers who are too sick to be on the job, or workers who, who have retired and gone home to die, or workers who've moved elsewhere. But they did include 18-year-olds who've been on the job for two weeks and who couldn't possibly have had time to contract the disease. So it's a phony study. It's, it's an artificial study. It's a, a scientific study designed to fool the public. When top American scientists studied the long-term workers here, they found the true level of lung damage was not two, but 75 in 100, and that three out of every 10 deaths here were caused by lung cancer or asbestosis. In North America, the, the name of the game is called uh, cover your ass. That's what's going on here. So they'll show concern with their studies, whether it's official or not, they'll minimize the, uh, the hazard and the, uh, the suffering of the workers because obviously this will make it more difficult to sell a product which is hazardous. Uh, they have to pay uh, compensation claims and uh, it's not in their economic interest to uh, say really what the severity of the situation is. They found 714 workers here with damaged lungs. Almost 600 of them had not been told by the mining company's doctor they were sick. They, they had an attitude, as far as I could see, if they could package the stuff and sell it for breakfast food, they, they would. With millions of pounds and thousands of jobs at stake, it's not surprising the local community reacts strongly to opposition. It started with a few hostile letters uh, saying, uh, what are you uh, trying to destroy our local industry? Uh, who's behind this anyway? After that kind of, of buildup of opposition with official support from the government and from newspapers, at that point I started getting uh, death threats and phone calls at 3 o'clock in the morning saying, we know where your children go to school. Now, unless you shut up, we're going to get them. I would say I got about 150 phone calls uh, specifically against... phone calls? Oh, yes, and mostly specifically against my children. And uh, finally it got to the point uh, of windows in my house being shattered you get a phone call at three in the morning saying we're coming to get you and half an hour later a rock goes through the bedroom window or the children's bedroom window. It, it finally got to the point of having a, a dead rat nailed to the door of my house. With opposition stifled, the companies continue to export their white gold worldwide. They tell their customers asbestos, without a shadow of a doubt, is one of the safest products on the market today. Canning Town, London. I'm Frank Howard. How are you? All right. Can I sit down? Yep. Have a chat. Sit here, are we? Cool, yeah. Cold today, isn't it? Ooh. Oh. Oh. How, how are you? Looking along. Well, oh, more important. How are you? Not too bad, how's things? How's the Tom? Well, um, I wasn't very well yesterday, Fred. And I uh, went to the hospital yesterday. Mm -hmm. I sent me over a private car. And uh, he said he'll have a look at me again on Friday. Mm -hmm. This is the London, not the, the London, London chest. Was, there was a man, he was only young. Mm -hmm. and he was dying, Fred, and it was so sad, you know? Mm -hmm. But I didn't know whether he was the same as me or just cancer. Mm -hmm. But you were seen in the hospital with the way they were trying to fight for that man. And well, I they do what they walk, can, obviously. Yeah, I walked into it, Fred. And I seen it, and I thought, "Was well, is that going to be me mm. on that table there? Am I going to have to fight like that? I'm not going to say I'm going to die tomorrow. I might live another two, three years. Please God, I do. But Fred, you couldn't live in that kind of pain. I don't want to go down that brew, you know. No, no. Because if I go down that brew, I've got to come up again. Mm. In Yorkshire, Alice is still struggling against her cancer. This is her first day out of bed for three weeks. She used to walk miles over the local hills. Now she can only hobble to the end of the lane, and that with her sister's help.
Alice is on her way to hospital for further treatment to kill her pain. She's a typical West Riding lass. She's tough and realistic. And you can't kid this lady. This lady knows exactly what the score is. She's watched many of her friends and neighbours who have suffered this same disease, and she knows exactly what's happening. And she's doing her best to, to make sure that her family suffers as little as possible uh, as they support her to her demise. How long would you say her demise is away, then? Three or four months. My Patsy doesn't know. She just knows that I can't pick her up anymore, you know. She's always saying, well, before I went into hospital for that operation, she would just say, when are you going to have that lump off, Mum, and you'll be able to lift me up and play with me? And now, you know, she just knows I can't pick her up. And, uh, because she's too young to tell what I have told me, boy. He's 15, you see. I told him when we were walking along the road one day. But it was best time to tell him then, innit? You know, he wouldn't cry so much. But he did. Apart from the victims, the rest of Britain remains largely ignorant of the real dangers of asbestos. It's very different in America. You could be a casualty of World War II and not know it. During the war, one of the materials workers used to build this ship was called asbestos. And after all these years, they found that working around and breathing asbestos may cause bad lung diseases, including cancer. Millions of people have worked around asbestos dust. The asbestos epidemic is so big here that the government even televises warnings. Maybe you worked around asbestos years ago. Maybe you'll get sick, maybe you won't. Don't take any chances. Would you please rise and salute the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag. But those warnings came too late for these victims. They're part of an epidemic caused by white and brown asbestos, not by blue asbestos, which has been scarcely used in America. So this group of victims is called the White Lung Association. This dreadful disease does not care about age, or the amount of money you have, or how big you are, or how strong you are. It cuts you down piece by piece. So can blue asbestos really be so much more dangerous than white? Lawyer Ron Motley specializes in asbestos cases. We have clients who've been exposed to nothing but white asbestos, and they die just as quickly and just as horribly as do people who are exposed to blue asbestos. So as far as I'm concerned, there's not a dime's worth of difference. It's both of them kill, both of them kill quickly, and both of them kill without notice to the person they're killing. This New York hospital is the world's leading center for the study of asbestos disease. We have very little information about what blue asbestos can do. If it's any worse than white or brown, then it you know, just must be fierce because the, what we've seen in our shipyards and among our insulation workers or in our factory workers uh, has been very bad indeed. Uh, for example, Insulation workers in the United States, lacquers, I think, in Britain, have been followed by us for about the last 20 years. Their experience has been extraordinary. For example, men who are 30 or 35 years from onset of their work, about 40% of them die of one or another form of cancer. Mesotheliomas, that's a cancer of the lining of the chest, the lining of the abdomen, lung cancer, cancer of the esophagus, the stomach, the colon, the rectum, cancer of the mouth, the tongue, larynx, kidney. We followed 17,800 laggers from 1967 through 1976. There were 2,271 deaths among them instead of the 1,660 we expected, given their ages in 1967. Of these, one out of every five men died of lung cancer. It was simply a disaster. Dr. Selikoff's team predict that every 50 minutes between now and the end of the century, an American will be killed by asbestos. That's a death toll 
of nearly 200,000 people. Other estimates are as high as one million dead. Now that evidence has increased that asbestos can travel around the body, causing cancer. We found it in the thyroid gland, which is in the neck. We found it in the brain. We found it in the intestines. We found it in the spleen. We found it in the liver. And so we concluded that asbestos fibers can be carried by way of the bloodstream to different organs in the body. The US government's Department of Health officially regard white and blue asbestos as equally dangerous. They say there is no evidence for a safe level of asbestos exposure, even at very short exposure periods, one day to three months, significant disease can occur. It doesn't uh, matter what kind of job you have. We've represented football coaches, high school principals, lawyers, doctors, nurses, everything but Indian chiefs who've come in contact with asbestos and have gotten disease as a result of it. But the, the, the families that come up out of the chair, people like the football coach at a major American university that we represent, and there at the, at the, at the top of uh, the ladder of success in his profession, he's stricken with an asbestos cancer. And I sat in that family's living room. That man never smoked a cigarette in his life and looked at the anguish on he and his wife's face and his children when he sat there and said, why, why did I get asbestos cancer? I only worked with it for two summers, and all I was doing was trying to get a college education. And look what it did to me now, I'm dying. And the man died, and the family was very frustrated. They were torn apart by it. You don't have to see too much of that and read where the asbestos companies were concerned about stirring up a hornet's nest to get damn mad about what went on. Even in the most affluent areas, asbestos cancer can strike. Oh, that's a good night's sleep. Now, Francis Harrig needs round-the-clock nursing. Sure. But Francis had no direct contact with asbestos. She was just a secretary for a firm that cut up white asbestos sheets. But that was enough. Now, Francis knows she's living on borrowed time. Now, after they told me I had had so long to live, then when I'd, I'd pass another year, uh, you become a little bit more frightened. Is this going to be the last one? And uh, you wonder how you're going to react when your doctor tells you, this, yes, this is the last one. Now, he has not said to me, uh, you have six months or 10 months. He said it would be a matter of months. Uh, I don't know how quickly this disease is going to progress. Apparently, it's been a rather slow growing tumor in my case. But I am going to uh, enjoy each month that I have as best I can. Four months after this interview, Frances Harrig died peacefully in her sleep. This little boy has never seen his father. Five weeks before he was born, his father died of asbestos cancer. John Rossi was a Wall Street lawyer. His asbestos exposure was incredibly slight. Age 20, he loaded white asbestos sheets onto lorries for just two weeks. But those two weeks were enough. At 32, he died of the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. I've lost the most important thing in my life. Uh, I think it's very lucky when one man and one woman and can somehow find each other and, and love each other as much as John and I did. Um, we were best friends to each other, laughed a lot, um, had great plans for our, for our future together, looked forward to growing old together. I, it's, uh, it was just taken away from me and from him. America's most famous asbestos cancer victim, Steve McQueen. Exposed to asbestos as a Marine and in some of his films. He tried every treatment his money could buy. At a Mexican clinic, he recorded this tape. Congratulations to your wonderful country on the magnificent work that the Mexican doctors, assisted by the American doctors, are doing at the Playa Santa Maria Hospital and helping in my recovery from cancer. And thank you for helping to save my life. God bless you all. Steve McQueen.
but even Steve McQueen couldn't beat asbestos cancer. and He died soon afterwards. Don Carson is a heavy goods mechanic. At work, he used to blow white asbestos dust out of brake drums when he was changing the linings. In their holidays, his sons used to help him. In 1980, when his eldest boy Johnny was 11, his parents were told their son had the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. Oh, I really went to pieces. And so did John. I think we just looked at each other and John said, why me? And I couldn't answer him. And I called Don and I told him that they were malignant. And he just went to pieces too. You know, this always happens to somebody else. It's not going to happen to you. You know, that was... And I think we're really happy. It's like, you know, when I was told what it was, I knew it was incurable, because they had told us that. Yeah, there wasn't anything we could do. We had to sit and watch our son die and not be able to stop it. Uh, I never had anything hurt so bad in my life. John could do uh, 50 push-ups last summer. And then just before he died, he couldn't even lift his foot back up on the wheelchair. And that just, just killed me because uh, he was so athletic. We watched his, especially his arms and legs, they shrunk to just nothing. There was no muscle left. If, if you went to touch him, it was very painful because all there was was bone. I couldn't hug him. If you hugged him, it hurt. Couldn't hold his hand. You couldn't sit next to him. He tried. And he'd be quiet about it. But you knew it hurt. It just hurt him to even just hug him. There was nothing left. On April the 13th, 1981, Johnny Carson had a small party at his home. That night he died peacefully in his sleep. He was 12 years old. Just for one day, one day, I'd like those asbestos manufacturers to have the pain, to have the cancer for one day. Just watch him. And I can guarantee they'd never do it again. <laughs> For 18 months, Tony Richards blew out brake drums daily, just like Johnny Carson's dad used to. Hundreds of British mechanics do the same. That's the way I was showed in the garage when I first started out. That's the way they showed me to do it. Just blow it out with an airline. Well, as an apprentice, I was, that was the way we were shown to do it. So you've got to get the dust out of the drum to prevent the squeaking. But the only way to get it out is blow it out of the way. What do you think about it and now you know some of the dangers? Well, now... I think it's silly, you know, it's a silly way to do it. But like Mina just told you, it's the easiest and the quickest way to do it, you know? Are you worried about your own health at all from blowing up brake drums? Uh, well, not really. I don't really know what it does to you. So I'm not really worried about it. If I knew what it can affect you, then obviously I'd take a bit more care, but I've never really read what it does to you. All it, all it does is there's a warning on the packet that can damage your health, but that's as far as it goes. Overgate Hospice, Yorkshire. Alice's condition has worsened. She's been moved in here. Treatment to kill the intense pain has left her legs virtually useless. Now she has to walk with the help of a frame. The doctors gave her six months to live and already she survived for a month beyond that. In London, Georgina's condition has deteriorated too. She's been moved from her East End home into St. Joseph's Hospice for the Dying. I never saw you. I thought, oh, it's, it's, well, it's just driving me mad. Yeah. It's, um, I can't explain it to you. It just keeps on and on, you know what I mean? I've had to come in for a rest. Well, it's worse than being in a condemned cell. I'm doing all the fighting I can, but I'm too ill now to fight. I try, but I still can't get anywhere with it. The 
because I'm not 60 year old. Mm. And I should, I should have, I should be enjoying myself at 60. I worked hard all, all, all my life. Mm. And I've got to just throw everything away. Mm. There's nothing I can do about it. What can I do about it? But how long it's going to go on, I can't say. But I'll fight them right till I'll go in. Ten days later, Georgina died. She was 52. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. Near restful waters he leads me to revive my spirit. He guides me along the right path. He is true to his name. If I should walk in the valley of darkness and death, no evil would I fear. You are there with your comfort. Surely goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. In the Lord's own house shall I dwell forever and ever. Georgina's post-mortem confirmed that she had died from lung cancer and asbestosis. But what about compensation? Seven months before Georgina died, she applied for industrial disease benefit, but was turned down. The government panel of doctors denied that her lung cancer was due to asbestos. After her death, the Department of Health and Social Security admitted that their doctors had got it wrong, agreeing that for two years before her death, she had in fact been 100% disabled by asbestosis and lung cancer. But that admission of error was too late for Georgina. She was already dead. So was her apparently unjust treatment a rare exception or regular occurrence? David McLoonan from Glasgow was an asbestos lagger for years. He was told by the hospital that he had asbestosis, even shown the scars on his x-rays. Then they sent him to the panel doctors. I wasn't in the same for three weeks after. I never left this house for three weeks after. I was in a terrible state. Why was that? <coughs> well, they took so much blood out of me. There were about five to seven different doctors. They had a tap in my arm. And while I was walking... A tap? A tap. They just turned the tap on and ran the blood out. That's nothing. They had me on a, a treadmill. And by the way, when, when you're walking and when you're on a treadmill, there's a hook on your nose, a clip on your nose, so that you can't breathe through your nose. <coughs> While I was on the treadmill, the taking blood I actually collapsed on the treadmill. How long was it before you actually got your pension then? Well, since I stopped work till I got my pension was seven years. Seven long years. Charlie Huckstep's case seemed even more unfair. As a docker, he'd unloaded asbestos cargoes. Young, fit and healthy, he suddenly contracted cancer. When you see a man like I have and nursed a man in pain and you love him, like I did and I still do, then instead of praying he would get better, I prayed he would die because you wouldn't see a dog suffer like it. It was really that bad. So how old was your husband when he actually died? 31, yeah, 31. Did you get your industrial diseases benefit as a widow from the Department of Health, 55 pence a week. Oh, no, I didn't get that. I, they said I wasn't entitled to that. A world specialist on mesothelioma had told the panel doctors that Charlie's cancer was due to asbestos. However, his cancer was not one of the two types which officially entitles the victim to government compensation. So Anne Huckstep, widowed at just 29, was left to bring up four children with no compensation whatsoever. Anyway, for widows, industrial diseases benefit is just an additional 55 pence a week. George Bleakley, a clerk of works, had slight contact with asbestos on an irregular basis. At 41, he developed asbestos cancer, and with a diagnosis certain, he applied to the government panel of doctors for compensation. But just like Georgina, they turned him down, and he died soon afterwards. But once again, the post-mortem revealed that the panel had made a tragic mistake. The post-mortem showed that um, it was malignant mesothelioma, 
that the tumour had spread from the chest area, but his heart was embedded in it, and it went as it had travelled through his body um, to the extent that it was at the time of the post mortem in the ureter. How about your son? What sort of effect did it have on him? For um, about six months, Robert was very good. Then uh, he had a breakdown and cried for several days. His schoolwork suffered very badly. We exist from day to day, and we hope that each day brings normality. But it doesn't. George Bleakley was not alone. Three out of every four applicants to the government panel of doctors received no government compensation whatsoever. The panels themselves seem to, along with a lot of the doctors that we come across, seem to see their prime task as being guardians of the taxpayer's purse. Uh, and to that extent, they really do put the widows and the victims through dozens of hoops before they pay out a bit of the taxpayer's money in terms of benefit. At home in Yorkshire, Alice's thoughts are not on compensation, but on the effect her fight against cancer is having on her children. Oh, Patsy's a bit upset again because I've got to go into hospital again. She said, I won't come and see you this time, Mummy. I said, why? She said, I just don't like hospitals. She said, I love you, but I don't love hospitals. She said, don't go, she said. So I said, well, look, I said, when I go this time, I said, I'll be able to cuddle you properly when you come out. And she said, honestly, she says, with that arm there, she says. And I says, yeah. And uh, she looked right to me. She went off to school all right this morning, you know. So I won't be here when she comes in tonight. But um, it isn't that. It's just that, like, I went all set to the night to me. We sat downstairs and he just had a bath and I sat down there in his dressing gown and he said, <coughs> he said, I don't like the idea of going into hospital, Mum, he says. And if I were to to you, he said, I'd, re I'd just as well have you sat there, just like a stick and say nothing at all as long as you're alive. I just want you there, he said, even if you can't move. That's what he said. Poor little lad. I found it right touching, really, especially when a lad stays out like that. Because you don't look upon lads as being a bit sentimental, do you? But our Paul is... Yeah, he said, as just long as you're sat there, he said, I'm not bothered if you can't move, Mum. He said, but don't die. I've cried a lot lately. It's just so, you know, it's not fair.
In Yorkshire, Alice has received an offer of compensation from Cape Asbestos. I was really insulted because uh, they don't know how I feel. And you know, for a week of this pain, what they offered me wouldn't, wouldn't compensate. It wouldn't. And they offered me 13,000. And I mean, my husband's 65. And uh, how long is he going to be here? You know, I wouldn't wish it on the worst enemy. I wouldn't, honestly. Not me. Yeah, you said, what do I think about Kate? I hate him. No, oh, I bloody hate him. I don't know why I hate them, do I? It's just a word. Throughout Britain, there are 800 workplaces using asbestos, 32 of them large factories. It's a multi-million pound industry. To promote asbestos, the industry produced a steady supply of glossy brochures. In 1976, nationwide advertising like this cost them half a million pounds. Meldreth near Cambridge, home of Eternit Limited, part of the world's largest asbestos cement group. This was the one factory the asbestos industry allowed us to film inside. On our visit, most of the factory appeared quite clean and the managing director was extremely confident about Eternit's health record. We think that the levels that are being obtained now in the fibre counting and the fact that we're not using anything other than white, white asbestos makes it absolutely minimal. And I think the point that I must emphasise Regrettably, in this company, in 50 years, we have had one case of asbestosis. And did you know that? One case in 50 years. And that man stayed with us until he retired at 65, and then regrettably, when he was 66, he died. But have you had uh, mesotheliomas or cancers? No. But we found at least five cases from this factory. Daniel Archer, asbestosis. Bert Adams, mesothelioma. Arthur Ward, mesothelioma. Lillian de Bonaire, mesothelioma probably related to asbestos. And June Rule, mesothelioma, dead at 42. Again, we asked Eternit about their confident claims. This time, they did admit to two mesotheliomas. Both, they say, nothing to do with asbestos. Plus one mesothelioma unknown to them when interviewed. In 1978, Peter Smith Evans became health and safety officer. When a man went inside the, the mill, mill area to actually retrieve bags, obviously he was completely covered in asbestos fibres and there was nothing done about this. Um, he would continue work in this state. When you say completely covered, what would he look like? Well, he would have uh, large quantities of asbestos fibres stuck to his clothing. Um, and this would be from head to foot and very often all over his hair and, and on his face. Um, the situation was under normal operations, he would also be in a very similar uh, state as far as asbestos fibres were concerned. And also in a nearby village, Eternit dumps its waste in a pit. We found the pit completely unfenced, waste not covered over properly and with easy access for local residents, including children. There is possibly a, a considerable amount of danger to people living in close proximity to that, to that particular pit. Uh, after all, we're talking about people living within 50 yards, in fact less than that in some cases, of that actual pit. And if that stuff isn't kept covered up all the while, then you're going to get uh, an amount of airborne asbestos fibres. And could people, uh, children for example, get in and actually play there? Oh God, yes, it wasn't sealed off in any way. As far as the dangers to health with asbestos were concerned, there was no uh, warnings of the, this sort of nature. Eternit's one acknowledged asbestosis case Alec Watts, certified for 15 years before he died. But there was no mention of asbestos on the death certificate, and death was certified as due to bronchopneumonia and emphysema. There was no post-mortem and no inquest. The certificate was signed by Dr. Paul Harper. Signed. Open your mouth, take a nice deep breath. Dr. Harper, Saturnit's part-time company doctor. Uh, Why did Dr. Harper 
failed to put asbestos on the death certificate. He told us last week, I gather I signed a death certificate, not putting the word asbestosis, which I knew he had. Quite why I did that at the time, I don't know. Turner and Newells of Manchester is the most powerful company in the industry. Last year, their turnover, 622 million pounds. From here, they employ nearly 5,000 people in 14 British factories, ranging from asbestos cement and textiles to Ferrodo motor products. But it's this Rochdale factory, the biggest asbestos textile plant in Europe, that's the heart of this huge empire. It was here that Samuel Turner began using asbestos 103 years ago. Turner's prides itself on its pioneering work in health and safety and its keen interest in the welfare of its workers. In 1920, they said, the workshop shall be as a sanctuary to which men shall enter with joy in their hearts and laughter in their eyes. So we began by asking the workers how much they knew about asbestos disease. Turners are clear. All workers are fully informed about the hazards of asbestos. Are you worried at all about working in an asbestos factory? No, I no. don't. It doesn't affect me. It's a, uh, Do you know what, what diseases you can get from asbestos? I don't know, to be honest with you. Do you know what diseases you can get from oh, asbestos? Oh, I do, yes. Well, can you tell me what they are? Asbestosis, for one. Uh, have you ever heard of mesothelioma? I've heard of it, yes. Do you know what it is? A very chronic chest complaint. Yeah. Isn't it? It's cancer. Do you know? Yeah, well. Do you know that? Can you tell yeah. me what diseases you get from asbestos? Oh, asbestosis. Yes. Do you know what diseases you can get from asbestos? No. no. Have you ever heard of mesothelioma? No, no. Do you know what diseases you can get from? We do know, but we, yeah. are, we are looked after very well by the uh, elf there and everything. Yes. You know, can maybe. you tell me what diseases you can get? What diseases can you get from this? Like I thought you said you idea. knew. Unable to reach agreement to film in the factory, after more than a year's discussions, we turned to the company magazine. Began in 1952, full of pictures of happy times, sports days and outings. On the front cover of issue three, Bill Jagger, the very first Firefly personality of the month. He also made issue four in the obituaries, dead from lung cancer and asbestosis. More recently, Eva Howard was another loyal employee. It was at the time when the asbestos industry was under attack from all sides. And she wrote to the local paper and said, I worked in the industry for 30 odd years. And it's, uh, it's done, you know, it's done me proud, and there's nothing wrong with me. And a couple of years later, she died of mesothelioma. So just how safe is it? For 50 years, Turner's has been Britain's showpiece asbestos factory. Since the 1920s, every investigation into asbestos disease has depended upon the evidence from here. The latest report, the government's asbestos inquiry, began in 1977. Once again, evidence from Turner's model factory was central. Turners are proud of the cleanliness and good housekeeping in this factory. As this film taken a few years ago shows, thousands of pounds have been spent on dust extraction equipment to keep dust levels below the legal limit. The monitoring of the asbestos dust and the regular medical checkups seem impressive. In 1978, Turners were very confident of conditions inside the factory. It is extremely unlikely, they said, that anyone commencing work at TBA will have his health affected at all. However, scientists from Oxford University predict that after a lifetime's work here, the number of these workers who will die of mesothelioma, lung cancer or chest disease may be as high as one out of every ten. At Rochdale in 1978, Turner's also said, deaths from lung cancer do not differ significantly from the national average. That was untrue. The lung cancer rate at the time was almost twice that national average and rising. And if Turner's breached the current legal limits, deaths could be even higher. This is Fortex, a safe, wet process that Turner's say is remarkably dust-free. But in 1982, the dust levels in Turner's Fortex department have breached the legal limits significantly. Even worse, experiments at Edinburgh University injecting Fortex dust into rats have shown that this supposedly safe process can give cancer. A Turner's internal minute reports that in the rats, Fortex dust gave a high rate of mesotheliomas. So even in modern conditions, working at Turner's could be dangerous. 
Donald Robinson has worked in several departments, but mainly in Fortex. He thought that in modern times, working at Turner's was quite safe. Last year, Donald, who is married with four children, was told he had the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. Donald Robinson is age 39. Turner's also told the asbestos inquiry that in the weaving shed, a factory showpiece, which for 30 years has kept to below the legal limits for asbestos dust, they had no disease whatsoever, that not one single weaver has contracted asbestos-related disease. But what about this man who worked in the weaving shed? Records show he had suspected asbestosis. That was in January 1968, fully eight and a half years before Turner stated they had no disease whatever amongst weavers. He wasn't the only one, as these records from that same year, 1977, show. The number of weavers with suspected asbestosis, not nil, but 13. Among them, Joe Testaferrata de Noto. The medical records show he had asbestosis. That was in 1977. But Turner's let him continue work with asbestos and didn't move him out of the danger area. We've got a document which shows that, uh, that Mr. Donoto had uh, a de was a definite case of asbestosis. Did you ever know anything about that? No, 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 he wasn't. He was never told that. Well, I mean, this document here says, you know, it's in look, the doctor's... Look, just a minute. I knew Joe Donoto. There's no way that Joe knew anything about this at all. This is disgraceful. Was he ever moved? Uh, no, certainly not. He worked with me for the last 10 years. We worked back-to-back -back partners. There's no way that Joe knew that he'd got asbestosis. A few months after that last checkup, and nearly six years after the company doctor first diagnosed lung damage, Joe Donoto died of lung cancer. He was 54. Turner's also stated to the asbestos inquiry that they had 48 cases of mesothelioma, but that none of these could be described as cases of slight exposure to asbestos. But Margaret Crimes worked here as Turner's telephonist. Emma Marshall was Turner's office cleaner. But they both died of the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. This is Turner's own list of mesotheliomas. Among the exposure times, 16 months, one year, seven months, five months, three years, and the last one, a woman exposed for just 10 days. In this 1980 questionnaire, Turner's told one of the unions that the number of mesotheliomas in the previous four years was just three. In the same period, we found six. Turner's also told the unions in 1980 the level of asbestosis between 1950 and 1979 was just 20. We found 81. Even two years before that questionnaire, Turner's knew of at least 31, as their own list, complete with dates certified by the government panel, shows we found 50 more cases on death certificates. The total, not 20 cases, but 81. The real figure must be higher, because death certificates often fail to record industrial disease. Margaret Priestley, for example, was a jolly 17-stone woman. Before she died, she shrank to an unrecognisable 8 stone. Officially, she was 70% disabled with asbestosis. But there was no mention of asbestos on the death certificate. Yet this government panel report reveals her death was due to asbestosis. Edward Wellings died in 1981. He had asbestosis for 16 years before he died. Yet his death certificate stated he died from heart trouble. The Rochdale coroner even refused to hold an inquest. But this pathologist report shows that Edward Wellings in fact had asbestos in his lungs. Even worse, he had cancer of the lung. But neither cancer nor asbestos was on the death certificate. As a result, his widow never got the special pension which Turners normally give to asbestos widows. I don't see why I should suffer for 16 years and then say I ain't got it. And I think, well, I just think Turners are getting away with murder. Turners told the asbestos inquiry in 1977 that the prevalence of asbestos disease in their British factories was no more than one in 300. Yet Dr. Geoffrey Morris, then Turner's chief medical officer and a former university lecturer, was within months concluding the definite or strongly suspected cases of asbestosis at Turner's Rochdale.
was not one in 300, but more than one in four, after just 10 years at work. Soon after, Turner's and Dr. Morris parted company. The main asbestos inquiry authors never received Dr. Morris's vital one in four findings from Turner's, and they were never published. I think that um, no scientific fact which is properly conducted should be hidden under the pillow. It should be uh, allowed the light of day and given the chance of the eminent scientists in this country and others to criticise. And is that what happened in this case? It was mm. hidden under it, the pillow? It was never asked for. The British Occupational Hygiene Society checked Morris's X-ray readings. At Rochdale, they found well over half the workers, 58%, had the first signs of lung damage. That study has never been published either. That was five years ago. We then looked at Turner's other British factories. Leeds. This closed down factory was run by Turner's for nearly 50 years. Yet in 1982, Turner's still said they had no information on disease levels here. But in those 50 years, this woman's family has been decimated. Four members killed by asbestos dust. The first, brother-in-law, way back in 1928, dead, aged just 34. A few years later, father-in-law, then sister-in-law, dead at 31 from asbestosis. Finally, in 1979, 51 years after the first death in her family, her husband died of mesothelioma. In 1979 too, Wally Childs, a young, fit man, became another Turner's Leeds victim when he discovered he had cancer. He looked like an old, old man. I mean, he really did. Um, he had no colour, no colour to his face at all. His hair was grey and going thin. You could see his skin had gone almost transparent, like parchment. Um, his eyes were enormous, he seemed to follow me all around the room. But, uh, he still maintained a sense of humour, which was devastating for me because I had to uh, joke along with him. And uh, I sort of used to have to come out and bite my bottom lip and come downstairs and think, well, just keep going, you know, there's time to cry afterwards. Soon after, Wally Childs died of the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. He was 33, had never worked with asbestos, just breathed in dust brought home from Turner's on his father's overalls. How many more people have got to die? How many more men have got to literally suffocate to death before something's done about this? Glasgow. For close on 40 years, Turner's dumped waste asbestos to a huge hole at their factory here. Children could easily get into the 18-acre site. Tons of asbestos slid into the River Clyde. In 1981, at public expense, the huge tip was properly covered. The job was so dangerous, the workmen had to wear full protective clothing. I'm on record as calling it a biological bomb, and that's sincerely what I believe it to be. It's a long-term health hazard, and this has been blowing about asbestos just in this area for very many years. And the results of that, I'm quite certain, will lead to deaths. No one knows how many in the coming years. I've been very critical about a lot of authorities just dealing with this side, the Health and Safety Executive and Clyde Bank uh, District Council. But, of course, the real culp culprit is Turner's. They they've left a legacy here. It's, uh, this is a sort of tragic memorial, to my, my mind, for the future. This site has now just got to stay sterile for eternity, as far as I can see. And that's what Turner's have left to Clyde Bank. Washington, County Durham. When the asbestos inquiry worked out from Turner's evidence, how many dead here? Their answer? Just a question mark. But what about Ella Carr, a handsome, robust woman? Just a year later, she looked like this. Soon after, she was dead from the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. So too was her husband from asbestosis. I started with 25. There's two of us left. The others are dead with asbestos. The graveyard is full of my members. I have a black tie. I constantly wear attending funerals of asbestos cases. I would say that 70% of the people who worked at Washington Insulation Works has asbestos. Seven out of ten. Seven out of ten. And 
how many would that be in total? It will go into thousands. But one of the problems we have in Washington is because we're in a situation where nobody knows of us, with a forgotten land, most of our people die before they can get before the new money course panel. Consultants, hospitals, and doctors say they have asbestos. But for the record, that doesn't count. Sheila Fenwick never worked with asbestos. Her father just brought asbestos dust home from Turner's Washington when she was a child. At 51, she also died of the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. I would just like to know how many people Turner and Newells have killed that don't even know they died of asbestos. How many people who never worked at Turner and Newells, like my wife, she went from being a, a very, very smart, handsome, lovely woman. You know, she just went away to about six... Oh, We were married 28 years. Honest. It's a long time. Stephen Gibbs, chairman of Turner and Newells, said in 1981, people are our most important resource it is only through them that we can achieve our corporate objectives. Asbestos is certainly a greater menace to health than anybody at Turner Brothers realises that it is. And if, as a result of tightening of the asbestos regulations again, the factory here in Rochdale had to close, how would you feel about it? Well, quite frankly, it wouldn't worry me a great deal, personally. I know it's, it's a tragedy that people will lose their jobs, but if it's a question of losing jobs or losing your life, then it's as simple as that. There really is no choice, is there? Leeds High Court. Today, Alice hopes to force more generous compensation from Cape by giving evidence of her pain and suffering. Well, I don't think I should have had to do it in the first place. Uh, not at this time or any other time, because, uh, and especially this morning, because I've had a right rough night. And I've had three right rough nights. I've been walking the floor like I used to do with a baby. It hurts that much. I'm going into hospital tomorrow, by the way. Today? Uh, today, mm -hmm. when I've been here. Yeah. So, um, I'm hoping they'll be able to s s do something. Uh, however much compensation you get today, is it any compensation at all, really, for you? Well, what good is it now? It's no good now, is it? It's no good at all. Not as far as I'm concerned. A wealthy suburb of St. Louis, Missouri. Dana Bond has been widowed because of asbestos. Her case made American legal history. Her husband, Richard, worked for just a few months with asbestos, using a process invented by Turner and Newell and exported to America. Then this healthy, fit man developed asbestos cancer. His lawyers recorded this tape. You sound like swear the testimony you're about to give me the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so you got. Will you state your name, sir? Richard Wayne Bond. Where do you live, sir? I live in Ohio, Fountain, Illinois. How old a man are you? 32. Are you married or single? Married. What is your wife's name? Dana Bond. Do you have any children? 
three. <clears throat> Sir, uh, prior to your health problem, what had been your business or occupation? I was a teacher. I coached varsity basketball, coached football. Are you suffering a particular illness at this time, sir? Yeah. What is, uh, do, or do you understand what it is or what they call it? Uh, plural, plural mesothelioma, asbestosis. Asbestosis and mesothelioma. Three days after this testimony was taken, Richard Bond died, age 32. Turner's and their American agents paid his widow $1,400,000 compensation. That's nearly three quarters of a million pounds. Compare then the fortunes of Dana Bond with three quarters of a million from Turner's to ease her financial worries to those of Ada Brown of Rochdale. Like Dana Bond, she's a Turner's asbestos widow. Like Dana Bond, her husband died of the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. Soon after he died, a man from Turner's visited her. He sat down, had a chat with me and that, you know, and he said, well, Turner's had decided to give me this gift of 200 pounds. And at the time I was very upset because uh, I thought it was awful. And I thought, oh, no more. Just well. talking about it. When you say it was awful, the two hundred pounds, what do you mean? What do you mean? For a man's life, and his other's life. I'm in there. Now Ada Brown gets an additional seven pounds a week, but it's a grace and favour payment. Turners can cut it off at any time. Ada says she was never told of her basic legal rights. She could have sued Turners. Yet Turners say, "We accept our obligation to treat with consideration." and generosity, any of our people whose health has been impaired. Steve Hines' wife worked for Turner's for 21 years. She too died from the asbestos cancer, mesothelioma. How much compensation did he receive? Not one penny. He said, no, he said, there won't be anything. He said, because he said, when people go work at Turner's, he said, they know the risk what they're taking on. Were Turner's sort of helpful and considerate in other ways when she died? Only way they was considerate was I wrote them a letter about the pension scheme and they said they was going into it. And a week or two after, I received another letter to say I would be getting just over £100, which bought a headstone. But otherwise, the only other uh, thing I got was a wreath for a grave. That's a pittance. Uh, down south, we'd call that the widow's mite. And what that means is that's not much at all. That's disgraceful. Um, that uh, people who suffer that much from asbestos disease would receive so little in Great Britain. The average settlement in the United States is uh, upwards now of $100,000. The asbestos companies and their insurers are bemoaning the fates and saying we're going to go bankrupt, something's got to be done. Well, it's my opinion they ought to go bankrupt. And I will personally be delighted if every asbestos company in the United States goes bankrupt and every one of their insurance carriers suffers a loss because it was the asbestos companies and their insurance companies who had the knowledge and could have stopped this epidemic of death and disease that we have in the United States from the sale of asbestos fibers. They knew an insurance company in the United States as early as 1918 refused to insure people exposed to asbestos because they knew it caused harm. And for 50 to 60 years, with this knowledge, they kept selling it and didn't tell people. So anything that happens to the asbestos companies, they deserve. If they go bankrupt, they deserve it, and I'm in favour of it. Turner and Newell, Britain's biggest asbestos company, are a huge multinational organisation. Their asbestos interests involve over 40 separate companies in 20 different countries. Last year, the value of their asbestos production over £300 million. But are the conditions in these overseas mines and mills up to British standards? Sir Ralph Bateman, then chairman of Turner's, was clear in 1972. We are now able to provide conditions inside our mines and factories which reduce the risk of contracting any of the diseases in question to an extremely low and socially acceptable level. But these were the conditions at a Canadian mine where Turner's were the senior partners 
with Australian and American companies. Scores of burst bags, fibre everywhere, asbestos stuffed into bags by hand, dust levels eight or nine times higher than Turner's would be allowed in Britain. On the board of this factory, the time these pictures were taken, Sir Ralph Bateman, chairman of Turner's. In India, Turner's have interest in five factories. This is Bombay. As health regulations have tightened at home, Western asbestos companies have moved into the third world. This Indian factory was opened by Turner's in the 1930s, a few years after the first regulations were introduced into Britain may have seemed benign paternalism then to build housing and schools within the factory compound. Now we know that for young children to live next door to a factory must be highly dangerous. But in 1982, they still do. Particularly dangerous when just a few yards down from the school and houses, we found piles of scattered asbestos waste open to any adventurous child. One X-ray study here shows that 352 men, that's well over one in three workers, had some form of asbestosis. At another Bombay factory, three quarters owned by Turner's, the frontage has a well manicured look. Turner's say they apply the current British standard in our factories throughout the world. But inside, asbestos dust has led to cases of asbestosis. Masks are of inadequate cloth. Former workers have said they received no health warnings. Two journalists have been inside the Turner's plant. Outside the factory, it's right beside some railroad tracks about 40 feet away that uh, take people into the suburbs constantly. And I found an exhaust pipe just blowing out fibers, and the general area was just enveloped with fibers. And uh, the area at the back of the factory between the wall had asbestos sludge lying around and dried asbestos lying around in the open. And they had torn sacks lying around all over the place. Also, the dustiest occupations in the plant, uh, namely the bagging and disposal of the ventilator accumulated waste, which is just pure asbestos fiber, is all done by outside contract labor, uh, who are given absolutely no protection, no medical checkups. These are simply day laborers that are paid uh, two, three pence a day. Third World is using a lot of antiquated technology in terms of the uses of asbestos, which are outlawed elsewhere. The third world is also using that asbestos in a way which is outlawed elsewhere. And, and so there's a tremendous toll of death and disease that is being created. Uh, we don't see it yet because of the very long latency of asbestos diseases. But the, the third world is, is being used as, as a, a place where some operators are making a few fast bucks out of a lot of people dying. This little boy is playing on asbestos waste outside another factory. One American asbestos boss said recently, the third world provides a rosy glow in the industry's crystal ball. Overgate Hospice, Yorkshire. Once again, Alice has been moved in here. She seems to be improving. News of her court case against Kate has come through. What did you say when you heard uh, about your settlement in court? Well, I'm a bit upset, really because uh, you don't come to realise until you get a settlement made and realise what it is they're making it on. And when my husband comes to me, he says, uh, so what did you send uh, 36,000? And I says, well, I says, uh, it's a new body I want. And 36,000 pound won't buy that. You just can't give in, can you? You owe it to yourself and to your family to keep fighting, don't you? And when you get knocked down, get up and stand there again. And let never look at you. You've got to have some that, haven't you? I mean, just because we worked at that mill all them years ago, it didn't mean to say we can't fight back. Is it? So... And that sort of people will mill workers are around here. They all fight back. Well, they try to do, you know, but when you're dead, you can't, can you? So you might as well struggle on while you're alive. So you're fighting then. So just have to keep going on and put it up with it, the pain and everything. A few weeks later, Alice died peacefully in her sleep. She was just 48.
Last year, the world asbestos output rose by 2.4%. It's expected to double by the end of the century. One American asbestos boss said in 1982, now that the health scare is over, profits should rise again. Turner and Newell said, much of the steam has gone out of the anti-asbestos lobby. There's not that much concern in the UK.